rolling. You're listening to That Gets My Goat. Never again. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of That Gets My Goat. I am Big Anklevich. And I'm Rush Outfield. You sure this is That Gets My Goat? Well, what else is it going to be? It can be an episode of the rich motherfucking outcast, motherfucker. Hello, Big Anklevich. How are you doing, man? I'm doing good. How are you? Oh, I'm all right. I wish we had done this the other day because the subject matter is almost completely gone from my uh, short-term memory. Oh, that's too bad. I, I, so what you're saying is that it's it was kind of forgettable? <laughs> it was like a dream. And, you know, upon first waking, every detail of the dream is crisp in your head. But just a few minutes later, it's all fallen like little... Bits of dandruff through your fingers. Well, that's very poetic. Yeah, I uh, the other night uh, I went with my nephew. He wanted me to get him a movie from the Red Box. Now everybody has a Red Box, right? We don't have to explain what that is. Just for those international listeners, in, in case they don't have it, we'll say that a Red Box is a machine that has DVDs in it. You give it a dollar or so, and it gives you a DVD for the day, and then you bring it back and stick it back in the machine. Yeah, okay. Enough said. Anyway, he wanted me to take him to that, and we did, uh, and he wanted me to rent him Shazam, which we did a whole episode about when it came out. Yeah, I believe we called it Shazam in that episode, though. Oh, right. Your child still uh, fills his pants whenever he thinks about that movie. Yeah, probably. Of course, my adult child still fills his pants whenever he thinks about the cat in the hat. So. Um, he's not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> we tried to get Shazam and I looked and it was three ninety nine to rent it. Jeez, why? I don't know. I guess because it was a new release or something like that, or maybe the DVD was rented out and it was only available in Blu-ray, you know, and they they feel like they can charge a little bit more for the Blu-ray. Does that make sense? Uh okay. And so I told him, ah, look, let's find something else just in case, you know, there's something cheap. Because like you said, yeah, the, the red boxes used to be a dollar to rent something. And I think it's creeped up a little bit. But he looked on the list and he says, oh, hey, Bumblebee is here. And we pressed it and it was 99 cents for the DVD or the Blu-ray. And so I said, yeah, yeah, go ahead and get Bumblebee. So we, we rented it. We went back to the house and everybody else had already seen Bumblebee, except for me and my nephew. And, uh, and so... The two of us sat down and watched Bumblebee together. You couldn't get out of watching Bumblebee because nobody else could watch it with him. <laughs> I suppose that's one way of looking at it. But uh, you and I had talked. Uh, there was an episode, uh, the Can We Fix It? Right. Uh, it's a call and answer. Oh, yes, we can. Episode where we talked about the Transformers franchise and that we had heard such good things about Bumblebee, yet we just couldn't pull the trigger. Neither of us were willing to go see the movie. And, and as much as I loathe to repeat myself, can we fix it? No, we can't. <laughs> yeah, as my, uh, I, I just want to reiterate why we didn't go see Bumblebee, despite having many people. In fact, tell me again what your coworker said to you about that movie. My coworker saw it. He's one of those dudes that goes and sees every movie the day it comes out. Oh, really? On the pirating website. <laughs> he goes to Starbucks and uses their Wi-Fi. And I was like, oh, you went to see it? And he said, oh, on the pirate website. And I said, oh, okay. <laughs> he said... You have got to see that with your daughter because he's uh, this guy is really into cars. He likes cars a lot. And he's like, oh, this is the perfect movie for you to go see with your daughter because she had just recently, you know, we'd got her license and she got her first car. And he's like, oh, it's perfect for you to see with your daughter. It's, it's the perfect uh, movie of a girl in her car. And I thought, huh, I don't think that I can do that, though. I made a vow. It was a sacred vow. I made a promise on the grave of my parents. Yes. I swore I would never watch a Bayverse Transformers movie again. Fool me once. 
Yes, and and I as much as I love to just talk about how awful that franchise is. I mean, awful is not even the word for it. It's it's a franchise so bad it is impossible to describe without profanity. <laughs> Everybody was saying, "Oh well, you got you should see Bumblebee," and I, and you and I saw the trailer for Bumblebee, and it looked like the kind of movie we would like. It looked like the old Transformers from our childhoods, and yeah, you told me about how there was the moment when you see Soundwave, and you're like, "Oh my gosh!" Yeah. It's really Soundwave. He didn't look like something that had gone through a trash compactor and then been given life by a a substandard CG company. (laughs) He looked like Soundwave. And so I I was just like, oh my gosh, I I, I want to see it. I'm feeling nostalgic. It's it's the characters come to life. You know what I mean? Which is exactly what one of these nostalgia, you know, revivals is supposed to be. Right. Like next year when that Ghostbusters movie comes out, if there's not a scene where Bill Murray and Dan Aykroyd and Ernie Hudson step out of a car or a garage or an elevator in their Ghostbusters suits and you hear some familiar bit of music, then they've, they've totally missed the point of making that movie with those guys. You want people to just be like, oh my gosh, my childhood. <laughs> And yet, even with that trailer, I, I, I wouldn't go see it. And uh, yeah, like you said, fool me once. You know, I, I, I criticize the Star Wars prequels daily, but the Star Wars prequels are high art compared to the Transformers series. And yet, my nephew said, watch Bumblebee with me. And I not only sat down to watch it with him, I paid to sit down and watch it with him. You disgust me. I, I disgust myself. Daily. You have no principles. Oh. It's, yeah, <laughs> it's true. I'm learning to live with a lot of things. <laughs> but you were the first person that I wanted to talk to when it was over. And here we are days later and I finally get to talk to you about it. In fact, I asked you if, if you wouldn't mind going out and and renting Bumblebee so that we could talk about it. And do you remember what you said to me? Uh, I said, F off, Rish Outfield. Never in all my days. (laughs) You did, um, which endeared you to me. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, you said, why don't you just tell me about the movie? I'll just, I'll take your word for it. (laughs) I took a vow. It was a solemn vow, okay? On the grave of his parents, yeah. It's like asking Batman to kill. Ah, moviegoers are a cowardly and superstitious lot. But yeah, I wanted to talk to you about it partly because I just, I wanted to say how I felt and see if somebody else felt that way. Because um, I think unanimously people said this was the best film in that franchise or in that line or whatever you want to call it. Because even though it's separated or divorced from the Michael Bay movies, not directed by Michael Bay, by the way, it, it, it's still part of that series. It's just a prequel. It's the uh, X-Men Origins Wolverine of the, uh, right. the Transformers series. But yeah, it was unanimously. Uh, we talked about it when you told me, oh yeah, it's, I saw it. We couldn't remember, but I wanted to say that thing got a 90-something on Rotten Tomatoes. And uh, we looked it up. Yes, a 93 on Rotten Tomatoes for a Transformers movie. Yeah. And And maybe that was part of why I wanted to talk to you about it. Because, yeah, I'm not going to bury the lead here. This was not a 93 on Rotten Tomatoes, this movie. It puzzles me that a movie could get such unanimous or close to a unanimously high scores or good reviews and yet be this middle of the road, this unexceptional. The Transformers movie before this one was called uh, Transformers colon The Last Night. And it had a 15 on Rotten Tomatoes. And we've talked about Rotten Tomatoes a lot. I believe that Rotten Tomatoes works. When you hear that it's 
rigged or that it's unfair or whatever. I'm just like, no, I don't think so. I think if, you know, 20 reviewers say that a movie is good, then chances are the movie is good. If 20 reviewers out of 100 say a movie is good, then chances are the movie is not good. You get that many people. It just, I mean, it feels like the most democratic way of reviewing a movie is saying, okay, a hundred different people said this. Yeah, seems legit. Anyway, I, 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 it seemed legit to me too. And now I, I, I wonder. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the movie. If you don't mind, can I just tell you basically the story of the movie? And you can a- interrupt me and ask me questions or just stop and say, okay, you know, I, I think I'm done. <laughs> yeah, so, so everybody lives happily ever after? Uh, yeah, that's good. What, what do you say? All right. Okay, so so this movie... Uh, and, uh, by the way, spoiler alerts for anybody who wants to watch Bumblebee. Yeah. <laughs> in case you hadn't realized that. And yeah, I invite anybody to watch Bumblebee, whether I liked it or not, just so I can have another opinion from somebody else who can say, no, it was great, or no, I, I, re- I agree with you, Rish. Uh, as long as you say no when you start your comment that it's acceptable. I was going to say that the, the majority of this movie takes place... Uh, in 1987, but it doesn't start out there. It starts out on the planet Cybertron, and we get this scene that starts out the movie that is everything that you would want a Transformers movie to be. The Optimus Prime and several recognizable Autobots are doing battle with several recognizable Decepticons that all look like the G1 animated series characters. And they sound like those characters. Like when Soundwave talks, it sounds like Soundwave. When Optimus Prime talks, it is Optimus Prime. When Shockwave talks, you know, it, it, it was designed to do that thing with the Ghostbusters stepping out. And you'd be like, oh, hey, my childhood. It's really violent. They're blowing each other away. The, the, the Decepticons have like laid some kind of trap for the Autobots and they're about to, to wipe them all out. And... Uh, Optimus Prime sends a little yellow Autobot like in an escape pod from Cybertron to this far off planet Earth. Prime's idea is maybe this far off planet will have the resources where the Autobots can set up a new base and be safe because there are very few of them left. And so the Autobots fight the Decepticons while the little robot, and he has a name, let me look it up. His name is B-127. He runs to this escape pod and he goes to Earth. And he arrives on Earth. And the yellow sun in mixes with his yellow paint and he becomes... Yes. Oh. And he gets the powers of a bumblebee. Yep, you're darn right. Except for he can't fly or sting. But he can gather pollen. Oh, wow. Awesome. I, I like, I'm actually, I, I think I'm of a different opinion than you. This sounds like a great show. It, it is a pretty great movie. From now on, I'm going to call B-127 Bumblebee. Oh, okay. Because that's who he is, even though he hasn't been given this name yet, okay? <laughs> Way to spoil it. And his escape pod is is landing and it looks like a, a meteorite or, you know, like a, a, a big flaming ball coming from the sky. And there's these military guys out in the forest, like like in the Everglades. Or, no, that's in Florida. Like in the, uh, where, where, where are the big trees? Uh, redwoods? Okay. Like there, like in Northern California. And they go to investigate and uh, they're led by... Uh, John Cena. Oh, of course. Yeah, they would send a professional wrestler to, to do that because the aliens would be intimidated by wrestlers. Well, well it wasn't just that. It's, it's like, who knows more about fighting right. than a professional wrestler? And he's there to train these other men in the, uh, you know, the ancient arts of the WWE. So these military guys, they see the the pod open and this robot come out and they open fire and they they start to attack him and then immediately after that like you know during this fight 
another tra- another ball comes into the sky. And this one is a Decepticon. And they never say his name, but apparently it is one called Blitzwing. And he is a, a bad transformer that can turn into a, a plane and a ah, tank. Triple changer. Uh, and he attacks Bumblebee. And they have a, a quite a, a spectacular fight. Blitzwing wants to find out where the Autobots are going, because I guess they escaped. And he, they have a, a, a knockdown, drag out fight, these two robots. It's really brutal, and it's impressive what a good fighter Bumblebee is, because... You know, he shouldn't be. He's little and yellow. And different. And he's better. Isn't that the last thing in the Advil commercial? Little, yellow, different, better. better. Bumblebee is injured. His voice box is, is deliberately torn out by Blitzwing. He's injured really badly, but he manages to kill Blitzwing before he collapses from his injuries. Like his, there are error messages going across his uh, his vision and one of them is that his memory is has been damaged. And John Cena and several of his guys are A-team injured by this battle. And an A-team injury is when there's like huge explosions and people are thrown into the air, but no one is killed. Uh-huh. And Bumblebee, before he uh, passes out or goes dormant or whatever you call it, before he, he, he dies... He sees a yellow Volkswagen bug and magically he transforms into that Uh and uh, becomes this Volkswagen bug and then he passes out. And so we we now cut to 1987. I don't know how long it's been. They never say. But we meet our, our main character who is, her name is Charlie Watson and she's played by Haley Steinfeld and... I, I'm assuming you've seen um, her in something. <laughs> I saw her in Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. No, you did not. <laughs> you heard her maybe in that. Okay, well, if that's all you know her from, then we'll just call I her. I might the, know uh, her from something else. What else was she in? Well, she was in True Grit. She was a little girl in that. Okay, I saw that. Uh, that was a long time ago, though. She was little by that back She then. was in i think two of the three pitch perfect movies oh she was in pitch perfect as well i saw the first one was she in the first one she was not in the first one uh i staunched the bleeding i i was (laughs) i was fooled me once and uh shame on me with that franchise as well that's funny because the first one is is pretty entertaining yeah well it's not my not my bag baby all right so she is a uh, a girl that's just about to turn 18 uh she's really rebellious her father has died and she works at hot dog on a stick mm, nice and is required to wear those outfits oh geez not even charmingly garish uniforms of hot dog on a stick her mother has remarried and she really resents everyone because of that, she's got a little brother. She's not thrilled with him. She doesn't like the new stepdad. She doesn't like her mother. She doesn't like her job. She wishes that she had a car, but instead she has a little moped. She's got a chip on her shoulder, and she's mechanically inclined. She's like really, really good at fixing cars. And there's a car, in fact, in the garage, and it's a it's, it's a nice car, like a. I don't know, Camaro, not a Camaro. That's what Bumblebee is. <laughs> but let's say it's a Corvette. There's like an old convertible Corvette in the garage, and we see her throughout the film trying to work on it, and she's never able to get it started, but she doesn't give up. And there is an obscene amount of 80s music in this movie, and it's that kind of needle drop where uh, the alarm goes off, and you hear... 13 seconds of an 80s song and then she gets out of the shower and you have her 11 seconds of an 80s song and she gets in a car and turns on the radio and you hear nine seconds of an 80s song and they just do that again and again and again you go to a party and you hear 14 seconds of a, an 80s song and that that should have worked you should be going oh my childhood yeah but it it felt too heavy-handed for me 
The only one that worked was about midway through the movie. Uh, somebody turns on the radio and you hear, you got the touch. <laughs> you got the power. And I was just like, oh, hey, that's neat. And so did you. Yeah, I'd actually heard of that one. So anyhow, she's the main character of the movie and she seems to have no friends and can get along with no one and a, a neighbor boy has moved in and he seems interested her in her from the very beginning and she doesn't know that he exists. She's not interested back. In fact, she's ridiculously rude to this guy and he keeps coming back and I was just like, really? Is that what it takes? Oh my gosh, I had no idea. Because normally you'd think, oh, they'll make a lifetime movie about a guy who is interested in the girl next door and she brushes him off and he keeps coming back. That's right. So, uh, yeah, she's the main character and she, uh, like I said, is about to turn 18 and uh, she goes to this wrecking yard and is get, always trying to get piece, parts for the Corvette and she finds this old broken down VW bug, a yellow one. And uh, it's infested with wasps. <laughs> There's one scene <laughs> where it's like it's got wasps nest in it or whatever. And I was just like, oh, gosh, because I'm terrified of wasps. I don't know about you. No, oh, yeah. But uh, I remember you had some kind of vehicle that was broken down. And when you finally <laughs> turned it on, it had become infested with wasps. Yeah, that did happen. I stood there with a hose spraying into the little hole that they'd use to get inside the back door. And one would come out and I would spray it with water and then step on it. And then I would keep spraying in the hole. And then another one would come out and I would spray it down to the ground and step on it. And I was there for like two hours doing this. <laughs> I used all the water in the state. Yeah. Okay. Well, she doesn't do that. She discovers that the bug is infested with wasps and goes to the owner of the wrecking yard and says, I, I, I want this car. Uh, I will work here for you for free if you'll give me this car. And, and the guy says, no, you can just have the car, which I, I, I thought was really nice. I, I wanted to like her a little bit more than I did. She was just mean to everybody. And I remember what it's like to be a teenager. And part of her issue is that her mother has moved on and married some new guy and the, the her little brother seems totally fine. All of them have moved on, but she hasn't gotten past the death of her father. And she used to be a, a, a diver. She would high dive and she would like do it competitively. She had a bunch of trophies of it and it's something that she and her dad would do together. He was her coach and she hasn't dived since. Uh, he, he died of, a, I think it was a heart attack coming back from one of her meets. And now she doesn't know who she is, I guess. Now she has to work at Hot Dog on a Stick. I mean, she also, you grew up in Northern California around this time. She also has like people in school that are really mean to her. Like there's a girl who, when she first gets this beat up Volkswagen, says, your dad really ought to buy you a nicer car. <gasps> oh, I forgot. Your dad's dead. Yeah. And I was just like, you know, I don't think anybody has ever actually been this much of an asshole. I went to high school and people sucked, but I don't think anybody has ever sucked that much, even in California. Uh, can you can you back me up on this? Yeah, I uh, there's no way that people uh, suck that bad. They only suck that bad in movies. In movies, yeah. You... Luckily, you didn't get Shazam, where they had not only bullies, but completely psychotic criminal bullies. Right, and then they would beat up on a guy on crutches and then boast about it. I don't know, dude. Maybe I just grew up in the wrong neighborhood. Anyhow, sorry. She gets this, this car, and she's trying to fix it up, and she wakes it up. It just needed some energy, some electricity. It just... It just needed a little love. I, you know, I, that might be it. It needed love. And it transforms, and it's a robot. And she's a little freaked out at first, but he's uh, an awkward, uh, good-hearted robot. I, uh, he's E.T., really, um, is what he is. He's, 
He's not a robot that would rub in the fact that her dad died then? Mm, I, I, I don't think so. I think at one point he does point to the picture that she has of her and her dad, and she uh, explains what the situation is. Uh, but he can't talk because uh, of Michael Bay. Because he's a car. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. I guess so. There, There's also a subplot going on that... There are two Decepticons, a female and a male Decepticon, who, whilst torturing the Autobot cliff jumper to death, discover that one of the Transformers is on Earth. And so they've gone there. They come to Earth looking for him. But they're not. And it's not Blitzwing? No, they, they're, they're made up. The male one is Dropkick, and the female one. Is a nut kick. So the female one is shatter, and the male one is drop kick. Okay. There's there's something interesting as as a. Do you remember when we were kids and we'd have to sort of suspend our disbelief when like Megatron or Soundwave would shrink or become big when they turned into a gun or a radio. Right. Didn't they come up with a term for that, like mass displacement or some crap like that? <laughs> well, maybe they did. But apparently that doesn't exist in the Bayverse. But what does is exist is a Transformer can see something, like a jet, and instantly become that. And I, for some reason, that bothers me so much more <laughs> than Megatron turning small enough that somebody can hold him in their hand. Yeah, I really despised that in the one Transformers movie that I did see when uh, Bumblebee was a Camaro, an old Camaro, and then Shia LaBeouf says, why are you a beat up old Camaro or something? And so he goes and he scans a nice Camaro and then he immediately becomes a nice Camaro. And I just thought, what? What's the point of transforming? Yeah, I, it, it's it was hard for me to get past that it's still hard i don't know why because at the end of the movie spoiler bumblebee sees a yellow camaro and he goes "Ooh," and he becomes that and i i i can believe (laughs) in sentient robots but it's really hard for me to believe that they can become something else in a moment that you know the 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 machines could i don't know because it's not like mystique who isn't actually becoming that person it's a uh, an illusion you know it's right i can't explain it but anyhow these two decepticons they come to earth and they become jets no no they become sports cars but one can become a helicopter and one can become a jet if they want to but they decide to go to the military and ask the primitive earth military for its help in locating this terrorist that they're looking for. And they hook up with John Cena again, who is immediately suspicious of these robots because of the experience that he had years before. But his superiors think, well, they have an amazing technology and we can use that. Oh, and they also say, if we don't help them, they'll just go to the Russians and give them this amazing technology, which makes sense to me. But they say, but we, we listened to you. As soon as we find this other one that they're looking for and they kill it, then we'll kill them. And so it's like, yay. <laughs> Meanwhile, uh, Charlie, the girl, and Bumblebee, be- they hit it off. They become friends. He ex- absolutely destroys her house and... I just, it, it, this was so hard for me to watch the part where he destroyed her house because they established that they don't have a lot of money. The, the mom is a nurse and she works like an incredible amount of hours and Charlie has to work, you know, making corn dogs and Charlie has a birthday and she asks for a car and her mother gets her a helmet for her, her little scooter, her motor scooter. And then their house is completely destroyed by Bumblebee and I just, I don't know, it, it, it really, it made me feel bad that this could happen. But it was funny, right? You know, I think that's the thing. I think it was supposed to be funny. 
I mean, Bumblebee bumbled around, right? Because uh, did I mention that E.T. that Bumblebee is E.T.? Right. There's a scene in E.T. when Elliot is at school and E.T. comes out of the, the room and, and he decides to explore the house. And, you know, he, 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 he breaks things and he's like going through the fridge and tries beer and he makes a huge mess and all that. And I feel like this was that scene if E.T. were 14 feet tall. And made of metal. Anyhow, eventually, the Decepticons track down Bumblebee. And I'm trying to remember, but see, Bumblebee doesn't have his memory. He doesn't know that he's a a warrior. He doesn't know that he's, you know, he's got a mission from Optimus Prime. But when he regains his memories, he turns on this message that Optimus Prime sent him, which was, you know go to earth and see if it's a place where we can use the resources and we can, uh, we can relocate there. And the Decepticons find Bumblebee when he turns on this, this message. Cause it's, you know, that they have, the robots have technology that we don't have. And as long as that technology is not in use, they couldn't find him. Does that make sense? Sure. I guess. I don't know. It, it it seemed to make sense to me, although it, it I don't know. It, see, this is nineteen eighty seven, and and satellite technology was really really primitive in those days. And the, these two Decepticons, they are able to link up with our satellites, and they can send a message back to Cybertron to the Decepticons to tell them that the Autobots are coming here, that the Autobots are going to Earth, that that's going to be their new secret hideout. So they go to this big, like, radio antenna thing, and they, they, they change it, the two Decepticons, so that it will link up with all the satellites and send a message to Cybertron. But it's one of those devices where, you know, it's, it's like it, it has to upload the message. So it's, you know, it's like 2% uploaded. 3% uploaded, 4%, you know, something like that. So there's a ticking clock okay. so that uh, Bumblebee and Charlie can go and uh, and take it down before this message gets sent. And we have our big action sequence there where uh, they fight. And I didn't really go into this except for to say, you know, that, that Bumblebee is really large, but these robots are so much more powerful than us it is like a child fighting the hulk <laughs> okay you know like automatic weapons do nothing to a, a a transformer and they have immense physical strength because they're huge and it's just like we we don't really stand a chance against them and so it's kind of a stretch that charlie and her uh, her neighbor are able to do anything to help Bumblebee fight these, these Decepticons. But Charlie is able to climb up the, uh, the tower and, you know, turn off the, 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 the broadcast, you know, disable the broadcast. That's something that she can do. Okay. So you can, she can put Logie's staff through the thing and turn it off. Yeah. Bumblebee, even though he is uh, weaker than the other Transformers is, uh, he's pretty tenacious and he's able to uh, to defeat them. And, and one of the things that he does is he blows up a dam and all this water comes rushing out and uh, the water... It drowns thousands of people? Well, no. It, it knocks over the Decepticon and like a an oil tanker crushes the Decepticon when it comes through the uh, the dam. But Charlie has to dive for safety into this water that uh, Bumblebee has made. And, uh, you know, she flashes back to her dad being a coach, teaching her to dive. And she does the first dive since he died. And it's to save her life. And uh, she's able to save Bumblebee's life, who is, who is trapped under the water. And uh, he takes a licking, but uh, he, he keeps on ticking. And... Uh, at the end of the movie, Optimus Prime shows up and says, you know, you've done a fine job, B-8. <laughs> B right, yeah, BB-8. You know, 
we'll definitely make more movies about you. And his, and Bumblebee is, you know, his name is Bumblebee now. And, and another thing that I didn't mention was that he does learn to communicate by he quickly goes over the radio dial and finds a song that happens to be playing that expresses exactly what he is wanting to convey. And when you say, well, yeah, but the Shia LaBeouf movies did this too. Yeah. Yes, they did. (laughs) And again, I don't know why I can believe that Decepticons can fly and Autobots can't, but I can't believe that whatever Bumblebee wants to convey at that moment is available on the radio at that moment. I just, I, I don't know why, but I can't accept that. Anyhow, I, I skipped about 45 minutes of the movie because I felt like I, my description was becoming tiresome. Was that an accurate assessment? I did nod off for a good portion of it. So yeah, I guess you could say that. Oh, okay. Well, then, then, then yes, I was wise to have skipped ahead. Skip to the end. <laughs> Man and wife. I want to talk about two things that I liked. There, so, so this next door neighbor guy is super awkward and I guess obviously interested in Charlie romantically and she spurns his affections over and over and over and over throughout the movie, but he does risk his life and he gets the hell kicked out of him throughout the movie trying to help her and, and, you know, help save earth too. And that's no easy task. And so at the end of the movie, he leans in for a kiss and she shoots him down again. <laughs> and she says, we're not quite there yet. <laughs> and to me, that was, I don't, I don't want to say it was refreshing because that was all too familiar to me. <laughs> but it was funny that it's like, even after all that, uh, you know, every movie we've ever seen, the guy gets the girl at the end and they kiss because that's how you know a movie is over. But she says, no, we're not quite there yet. And I thought, oh, well, that's, that's mean, <laughs> but, I, but I find that funny. <laughs> and then, yeah, the, the, the other thing that I, I liked was uh, that it seemed to be a lower stakes movie and there was, there, you know, not so many special effects, still a ton, but, you know, we were able to focus on Charlie and her friendship with Bumblebee. And that was what the main thrust of the movie was. It wasn't the civil war between the Autobots and the Decepticons. Right. At the end of the movie, it is time for Bumblebee to move on. And he, he goes off with Optimus Prime and I'm assuming the other Autobots, but they have like a, you know, a parting with Charlie and she feels like he's her best friend. And you get the moment of, you know, a girl and her car, the, the culmination of that. And, and I, like I said, it is E.T. and you get the tearful parting at the end of the movie and he becomes a Camaro and drives away. But she goes back to the garage and finally is able to get her dad's Corvette started. And so now she has a nice car of her own that she can drive around. And that's, that's it. That's the movie. I, I forgot to tell you that what the male Decepticon has a gun that when he shoots somebody, they turn into Vaseline. Oh. Which is probably not a good way to die. I don't know. You tell me when it happens to you. <laughs> but it's just like they instantly liquefy, but it, into sort of a gel kind of. <laughs> and he uses it on various people throughout the movie. And every once in a while, there was, there was violence. And it surprised me because it did feel like a movie for kids throughout most of it and uh, except for when the uh the demons appeared and bit that one guy's head off <laughs> i guess so I, I i i it wasn't as traumatic as that i don't think uh they do kill they execute cliff jumper who's sort of the red version of bumblebee in our childhood he was a he, he had the exact same transformation he was the same figure essentially Uh, But they cut him in half. They slice him from the top of his head all the way down in half. And I felt like, wow, that's that's kind of brutal. But I don't know. I mean, maybe all of these movies have been violent. 
and I, I've found that if it's non-human characters, if it's robots or demons or monsters or, you know, aliens, that you can kill them very violently and not ever have to worry about an R rating. Have you noticed that? Yeah, I have. Yeah, that that's why you have aliens and robots as the bad guys in so many movies these days. Is Now you can have your PG-13. You have... Earth invaded in all the Marvel movies by some kind of crazy CG aliens. That's right. The 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 droid army in the prequels. Yeah, the droid army in the prequels. So you could hack them with your lightsaber and blow them up. And it's safe to do so. Anyhow, uh, the whole point that I I wanted to make in talking to you for so long about this movie was, no, it wasn't a bad movie. Uh, the one that we saw in 2007 was a bad movie. It was the worst. But this was not a 93 uh-huh. on Rotten Tomatoes. I I can't explain it. it. It's so paint by numbers that, I mean, you could predict everything that was going to happen before it happened. It felt like like any movie made for a teen that we had seen. And the only thing that wasn't predictable was that they didn't kiss at the end. And I just, I I wondered, well, what is it everybody else is seeing in this movie and I'm not seeing? Or could it be that everybody else has seen the other Transformers movies? (laughs) And this one is so much better by comparison that it gets a positive review. And... 93 out of 100 positive reviews because of what came before. The worst franchise ever to be put on film. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure how to explain that. Do you think that that is possible? And if so, does that undermine the whole point of Rotten Tomatoes? Yeah, I guess. I, I think that that probably is the reason why it got uh, such a high score. The one thing that's kind of weird about Rotten Tomatoes is that people give their reviews and basically the the Rotten Tomato, I mean, they don't give it a plus or a minus or just hit A or B or something like that when they file their review. As far as I know, anyways, I think somebody from Rotten Tomatoes reads the review and decides, okay, this one is a positive review or, okay, this one is a negative review. And I've seen a lot of them where they're neither you know what i mean they're tepid reviews of movies but they have to give it okay this one is positive or this one is negative there's no like score rating or something like that it's not like each reviewer gives it a 70 and that's how it wound up with a 70 because it got 170 scores instead it was there was 70 positive and 30 negative Well, okay, sorry, sorry, let me interrupt and say that they will actually, on Rotten Tomatoes, they will give the percentage, but then they'll also give the average rating, and Bumblebee had an average rating of 7 out of 10. Yeah. Which sounds like a 70 to me. Right, that's what you would think, but but yeah, that's not the way that their formula works. Instead, it's a 7 out of a 10 is a passing grade, and this thing got... 93 passing grades. Ah, interesting. Out of 100. Yeah, just it's a pass-fail kind of thing. Right. I told you that when Steven Spielberg signed on to produce these Transformers movies, it was based on the pitch, A Boy and His Car. And Spielberg was like, oh, wow, that sounds great. Yeah, Uh, where do I sign? And this movie was definitely that, uh, only it, it was a girl... Uh, it was actually written by a woman, and I wonder if the movie would have been any different at all had it been a boy in his car. You know what I mean? How much of the script would you have to change or fudge if it was a boy, and would it speak to me more? Would I respond to it on a, a, an emotional level if the main character had been me as a, you know, a boy rather than a girl, is that a question that you ever ask yourself? Like, I'm trying to think. You and I had this conversation 
that when J.K. Rowling wanted to write these wizard books, her publisher told her that girls will read books about boys, but boys will not read books about girls. Do you remember that? Yeah, that sounds familiar. And so she's like, oh, okay, well, it will be a, a boy wizard then. There won't be Harriet anymore. And, and we've talked about that. You've referred to Harriet Potter many times. And I'm trying to remember what the context was. I thought that was a completely original thought that I just had there. Oh, man. I might as well just end my life now. Well, yeah, that's the thing. It's with time to end the episode. I'm killing myself now. I have no original thoughts left. Well, but, Sorry. Okay, along, <laughs> those, along those lines, though. And that's the other thing I wanted to talk to you about. And I realize that we've been going way too long to actually get to talk about this. But the movie was so middle of the road and unexceptional and average. But I had to ask myself, could I have done better? Could I write a better Transformers movie than this? And I, I don't know. I, if we proceed under the assumption that I have some talent in writing. And and I guess we kind of have to for this question to be posed. How much of your heart and soul do you put into the sixth in a, a franchise when they hand you, okay, we're doing the sixth Transformers movie and you get, let's say you get a hundred grand for writing it, whether it's good or not. And look, here's the bar. So just whatever you hand in, it's going to be fine. How much do you break your back over something like that? Could a better Bumblebee movie have been made than this? Well, a better one could have been made. Maybe the constraints that uh, are put upon it make it difficult because you got to be in the Bayverse. You know what I mean? It's going to have to be... This stupid bumblebee that can't talk and so forth. So I don't know if that makes it impossible to make it a whole lot better than this. I'm not a fan of the Bayverse in any way. And <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what it would take. I mean, I, I didn't see this and I, I I didn't really want to. I don't know what I saw from the other movies or movie that I saw in the franchise. The Transformers were not characters. They were explosions and comic relief and silliness, but they were never characters in their own movie. And I don't know if that still carries through how much of a character Bumblebee is other than just being E.T. but 16 feet tall. But, you know, I think that has got to be thing number one that's got to happen with a Transformers movie is it needs to be, okay, these these robots are characters. They have their own traits and their own personalities and not just really, really surface ones. You know, you got to give them background so that they can be interesting so that you can have them grow and go through an actual character arc and so forth and i think you know there there is the possibility to make a good transformers movie like that i don't know that uh that will ever happen till they somehow get rid of this universe they're all stuck in and we've heard criticism of the whole concept of making a Transformers movie. They say, well, what do you expect? You're making a movie that's just designed to sell toys. It's about a toy line, you know? It's like, it's like the whole point of the Transformers in 1984 was let's make a cartoon miniseries that's designed to sell toys. And then, you know, let's make a whole series and then let's make a theatrical film that's designed to sell new toys it is cynical in its purpose, but I still feel like there were moments of genuine brilliance and inspiration in those 1980s shows. And we talked about the death of Optimus Prime in 1986 a ton of times and how devastating that is emotionally to our generation, to 
to man boys who think of Optimus Prime as a living person, as a hero of theirs. Right. And so, yeah, it, it, it can be done. And it's possible that maybe I'm just too old or the wrong gender or too cynical or hate the franchise too much to have really responded to it the way that you're supposed to. That if you had taken your daughter, like your coworker told you, that your daughter would have been like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to get a car and be able to drive and, you know, and we'll call it Bumblebee, Dad. What do you think? And sh she cries when they part at the end, but you didn't. And you are just like, no, no, I think I'll just drive you places for a little while. I'm just, I, I don't know why I didn't respond to it, except for that I didn't recognize it as being a good movie. It was just everything that we have seen before in the same way that sometimes you will see a movie aimed for little kids, you know, a Ugly Dolls movie or something like that. The Emoji movie. And they're showing the best parts in the trailer and it's all just like jokes that we have seen in Looney Tunes cartoons or in DreamWorks movies just 10 years ago. But because they're aiming at kids that have seen nothing, the bar is super low. And uh, maybe a kid will respond to, or think that this is funny where you and I are just like, nope, you know, that wasn't funny when Bush was president. The Bush first senior. one. So what was it about the movie that that felt so... Was it just because it wasn't original? Was it because it, it felt like an E.T. ripoff? Was it really paint by the numbers? Well, yeah, that that's the thing, is that they it clicked a bunch of boxes. 80s music, click. Love interest, click. Action sequence, click. All of these things, but it it didn't do anything unique, and it didn't... It wasn't special in any way, in the, in the way that a movie that gets this high of a review should be. There's a scene where she goes to the cliffside where a bunch of kids are having a party. And that's where the mean girl from her school says, oh, oh you don't have a dad. His dad. And like this studly washboard abs, handsome jock from school that charlie is interested in he says hey i heard that you used to be a diver what do you say we dive off this cliff together nobody else around here would dare to do that except me and she's like oh no i don't do that anymore and he's like oh well, no everybody's watching let's let's go and he dives off and then she she won't do it she turns around and everybody's like loser and they're throwing like tampons at her and bags full, full of, of urine. urine and it i just was like uh, okay yeah that that scene is definitely in here for some reason i don't i don't know why it would be it's not it can't be a setup for diving later in the movie can it and <laughs> i just <laughs> i don't know i <laughs> Yeah, I, I paint by numbers is just the the best way I can describe this movie. It had, you know, comedic elements and none of the jokes were ever very funny. And, uh, you know, it had danger. But unless you were, you know, a military guy, you were never in much danger. You know, it's like Charlie was never going to get hurt or killed. You know, Bumblebee himself does the most damage to her life. I don't know, because paint by numbers can still work. I was telling you all about Creed 2, and I was bawling. Do you remember when I was telling you on the phone? And I was like, dude, the whole time I knew what was going to happen, because it was essentially a remake of Rocky 3. But it worked so well that I didn't care. Even if I knew exactly what was going to happen in the next scene and the scene after that, it was crafted so well that I was like, I've been on this roller coaster before and I love it. I, yeah, let's go again. And yeah, it was a really emotional experience for me. And I feel like this should have been, I mean, I know it wasn't for you, but for most people, E.T. was a very emotional movie. And this was essentially that same thing. And yet, yeah, I didn't care. I didn't really care about Bumblebee. I don't know what it is. That's why I wanted you to watch it. So you could say, I feel exactly the way. Or you could say, no. Dude, every time they played a Smith song, 
a little part of me that I thought was dead came back to life. Woke back up. The, the sound of that stuff makes me think of the, the way they used music in the Suicide Squad, you know. Whatever the obvious song was, was what they would play. You know, oh, we're going to introduce ourselves to all of these bad guys, so let's play Sympathy for the Devil. Okay, now they're, I don't know, I can't even remember much about that movie to go any further. Okay, well, there was a car chase scene. And a certain Sammy Hagar song came on the radio. What Sammy Hagar song came during the car chase? Well, of course, I can't drive 55. (laughs) And there's a scene where uh, Charlie gets an an argument with her mother about her dead dad. And she runs away from home. What Bon Jovi song plays when when that happens? She's a little runaway. They play that? (laughs) There you go. Good job, man. Wow, that's really bad. Uh, I feel like, yeah, I mean, there is a way that Transformers could be done well. Sadly, I don't feel like it'll it'll ever happen. It could be saved, but uh, will it be saved? The, the funny thing is, this is the one that was the most watchable, the best one of them all, I guess, despite being relatively uh, run-of-the-mill. It made the least money. It did terrible. It did. And what is the, you know, what is the takeaway that they're going to... What is the lesson? They're going to get from it, and I'm sure it's not, let's make more like this. So, I don't know. I'm getting old enough that I, I don't worry so much about it anymore. I've seen things come. I've seen things go. There will be good things, there will be bad things, and maybe not the things that I expected to be good or bad, you know? Maybe not the things that I wanted to be good or bad, but there will be good and bad things, and, you know, we can all just enjoy what's good and avoid the rest, I guess. Yeah, that's that's a good attitude to have, really. You know, there are certain franchises that are so important to me that a bad installment can really hurt me and make me just, oh no, kind of thing. But eventually I need to just grow up and say, look, there's going to be bad Pixar movies. There's going to be bad Disney animated films. There's going to be bad Star Wars or Marvel or fill in whatever blank you want. And it's not the end of the world. They will keep making more. And you just got to focus on the ones that are good. Right? Yeah. Enjoy the ones that are good. And let the ones that are bad go. You know, it's kind of funny for me sometimes, though, when you you get a keepsake. Uh, You know, I'm a toy collector, and so I have a bunch of toys on my shelf. It's interesting to get a toy after the first movie comes out, and then, I don't know, ten years later, they make a sequel to it, which is not nearly as good. And now you've got that thing on your shelf, and you're just like, huh, I wonder if people look at that and think, oh, this guy liked that movie? Because that does happen sometimes, you know, the the bad ones diminish the good ones. But just like what you like and don't worry about the rest. Okay, well, should this have been a Rish Outcast episode or was this good enough for That Gets My Goat Big? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, was this a tremendous waste of your time, I guess is what I'm asking. No, it wasn't a waste of my time. It was good. I think it was fine. I think it could be a, that gets my goat, but it's up to you if you'd rather make it a rich outcast. Oh, it was your idea, so you can put it where you want. I'll tell you where to put it. I was mostly just wanting to 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 talk about that and and to ask. I mean, can you make a sixth movie in the franchise that is is uh, the, uh, a franchise like this that that is better than this, or should I have just focused on the things that were good and said, you know, compared to the other. Michael Bay Transformers movie I saw. This is this is night and day. I just I sometimes we'll do a story on the show, or back when we did stories on the show, or I'll do an audio book or whatever, and you know that it's not great. There there are flaws or whatever, but don't we still have the obligation to turn in the best performance that we can? Yeah, I think so. I think that's that, that may not be. The, uh, what do they call it, the uh, opportunity cost. You know, you, you put in the effort for what you get out of it. 
and if you put in more effort than what you get out of it, then you lost some something out of it. But an ethical thing should be, yes, you always put in your best effort for whatever it is that you're doing. And you would think, especially if it's making a Hollywood blockbuster movie, that that would be the thing. And, you know, if it comes, if it's really great then you'll be in more demand. Even if you didn't get paid that much for this one, you'll be in more demand for the next time. Well, I don't know. Let's, uh, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll hang up on you, let you go to sleep, move on with your life, and uh, that's it. We'll talk <laughs> about something else sometime. All right, we'll do that next time. Thanks for listening, everybody, and uh, we will be back again with more That Gets My Goat, more stuff that we have to talk about. I hope you enjoyed the show, and I hope you can uh, turn the Transformers franchise around for us, because we'd like that. Get to work. (laughs) I'm Big Anklevich. (laughs) I'm Rich Outfield, I guess. (laughs) I don't know that I will uh, admit to that right now, but uh, thank you. Good night. Alright, see you folks. This is Graham W. Cox of the law firm Little Cox, Johnson and Wang, legal counsel for Doonstief Enterprises. My associates and I have reviewed this programme and it was decided that this disclaimer is in order. This objectionable filth now passing as entertainment was presented under a Creative Commons 3.0 license, which means it is free of charge to download and listen to. But only the Honourable Bigglesby Dougal Anklevich and the despicable Richelieu Benjamin Outfield are owners of said rubbish. Also, The statements in said podcast were not to be taken seriously, and therefore no litigation should be necessary. Thank you. I press the button. You're listening to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine.